are these people? I talked earlier about what Oz mentioned was to him the most important thing happening right now that people aren't talking enough about. This and he is mentioned the most election of our lifetime. Can we just stop talking about that person, please, forever? <laughs> can, we, can, can we become unburdened uh -huh. by her, please? <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna go to Indie Media Award honoree <laughs> Mondo Weiss talking about an op-ed that I saw this morning. Uh, that's right, Snow Himbo. Boss makes a dollar, I make a dime. That's why I poop on company <laughs> time. That's Karl Marx. I don't think that was you Marx. You exist but... in the context of all in which you live and what came before you. I swear, I think she was drunk. <laughs> but I thought this one was interesting. Being a Jewish person and knowing some people who still support Israel, they're not going to like this article. And if you support Israel, you may want to turn this off you right now. Israel? But I go, why? But you might not want to turn this off and you might need to listen. If you support Israel in the middle of a genocide, you're an awful person. Let's cut to the chase. If you're fretting about anti Semitism and the fears of insecurities of Jewish students in the middle of a genocide, you are an awful human being. Again, this is. An area targeted by Israeli bombardment. There's literally nothing left. During the worst attack on Gaza before this one in 2014, Stephen Salida, and by the way, this is written by Joseph Levine. I'm guessing that he's not a Palestinian person. Joseph Levine from Mondo Weiss. During the worst attack on Gaza before this one in 2014, Stephen Salida, a Palestinian professor of American Indian studies, had a tenured woman had a tenured offer withdrawn by the University of Illinois over some strongly worded tweets he posted concerning sorry, that attack. Sorry, where? Not Illinois, Illinois, because <laughs> you're annoying. Definitely you're Illinois. Illinois. Yes, Illinois. you are. You're Illinois. <laughs> Illinois. I'm sorry. I I live in mental Illinois. How dare you? Soon. Um, soon after. I published a piece in the New York Times blog, The Stone, also seen here, concerning one of those tweets. It said, let's cut to the chase. If you're defending hashtag Israel right now, you're an awful human being. And that was at 1146 p.m. on July 8th, 2014. Bye-bye, Israel. I wasn't addressing the obvious <laughs> violation of academic freedom represented by his case nor the appropriateness of his moral outrage at Israel's actions regarding those issues, I was totally with him. Instead, I considered whether I thought the claim in the tweet was, in fact, true. Were defenders of Israel during this attack indeed awful human beings? Let's set aside the obvious hyperbole of the statement and the fact that, of course, most people, no matter their deplorable views, cannot simply be summed up as awful. I disagree, but human character is a complicated affair. What I take to be the point of the claim, however, is that if someone, after the horrific punishment meted out by Israel on Gaza, could still defend Israel, then this manifested a serious moral character flaw. Without completely mm -hmm. rehearsing my answer to the question 10 years ago, briefly, it a went like a this. A mental character flaw? Uh, is this person in the... If you follow nonviolent communication, you're not mental judgment is the or root of all violence, Indy. How dare you? Uh -huh. how, how dare you? Well, I dare. Well, how dare you? I dare. How dare you? Ugh. It's important to distinguish between the moral status of an how action dare you? and the moral. How dare you? It's important to distinguish between the moral status of an action and the moral character of a person. As applied to the 2014 Israeli attack, I argued that though Israel's actions were indeed morally atrocious, people of decent character could still defend it given the surrounding social and informational environment in which they lived. Sounds like you're making an excuse for genocide personally, but that's okay. Not really, but all yeah. right. Given the nature of Western, especially American media, 
the standard assumptions of people's families and friends, etc., it's actually quite understandable how good, decent people might be misled into defending what are, in fact, morally abominable actions. But what are you going to do, right? Yeah. I then interpreted Salida's tweet as both aspirational and interventionist. I saw it as aspirational in the sense that it pointed to a world where people were sufficiently well-informed by the media, that's what we're doing here, and their surrounding social environment so that, in fact, only an awful human being would support Israel's actions. Well, you got a couple of them here. The way I put it then was that the tweet wasn't true, but ought to be. It was interventionist in the sense that he was helping to get us to that world by modeling the reaction that one ought to have. Well, okay. As I've watched Israel's genocide unfold these past nine months and seen so many political and media figures either outright defend Israel or produce so-called nuanced criticisms laced with excuses, <clears throat> J Street, I've had many occasions mm -hmm. to think mm -hmm. about Salaida's tweet. Given the scale of the current genocidal attack on Gaza and the abundance of information available from social media, and even the mainstream media, though one usually has to ignore the framing, is it now true that only an awful human being would defend Israel? This time, I think the case for answering in the affirmative is quite strong. One might ask at this point whether the question really matters. As I'm not a fan of clean hands politics, I don't think one's judgments of moral character normally have clear consequences about how one should behave politically. If the political calculation warrants it, I will hold my nose or get my hands dirty when required. For example, uh, though I indeed judge Joe Biden to be an awful human being, Stupidly, this person will vote for him to keep a much more awful and much more dangerous human being from winning in the election. Except that Joe Biden is more awful and more dangerous in just about every way. And it doesn't matter because Biden is blue Trump. Good for you, you fucking dumbass. Biden's blue Trump. Trump's red Biden. How many times I got to fucking tell you people? Biden's blue Trump. Trump is red Biden. If you don't like that, sorry. Take it up with those assholes. However, I do think this question of moral character matters a lot in two arenas. Now I have question over your entire judgment of morality because you're thinking that Joe Biden's any better than Donald Trump and you're a fucking moron for that. However, I do think this question of moral character matters a lot in two arenas, what I'll call deliberation in the public sphere and local interpersonal relations. By the first, I have in mind the many controversies we're now seeing in a large variety of settings over how to speak about Israel and Gaza. Remember, this is in Mondo Weiss. Organizations of every sort, whether it be government bodies like city councils and school boards or NGOs like schools, universities, sports associations, online communities, private businesses, etc., are dealing with questions yeah. and making public statements in the name of the organization on Gaza and disciplining the kind of speech concerning Gaza that takes place within the organizational spaces. Like, like for instance, <laughs> if someone on Delta Airlines, who looked fabulous and put together, by the way, should be on covers of magazines and whatnot, wore a Palestinian pen, God forbid, you know, he might get blasted online so that, you know, his job can get yeah. Um, you Get know, like and a Delta, I swear to God, if you capitulate to that, no one should be flying Delta anyway. But, you know, <laughs> you know. He says, I mentioned like, this arena mainly to set it aside here, but see this excellent discussion of the issue. And in the spirit of full disclosure, the author is my daughter. The only point I want to make here uh -huh. is regarding the controversies taking place in these public spaces over how to address Gaza is that this question of moral character is playing an important role, if only implicitly. One might think of it this way. Where is the line between the demands of minimal decency, not being an awful human being, and demands that are clearly political? Yeah. The case of 2023 and 2024 Gaza is bringing this question to the fore in unprecedented ways. 
but it's in the second arena, the realm of interpersonal relations, where I have experienced the effects of the Salaita claim most deeply. Until recently, I've been able to separate my political commitment to Palestinian liberation from my personal relations. You know what that means? He's overlooking Zionism and looking the other way about monstrosities regularly. He's saying there are many people, a number of them friends, who I knew felt quite differently from me about Israel-Palestine, and yet toward whom I had warm and friendly feelings. But now that's changed. Not completely, but in important and quite discernible ways. There are now many people whose company I can no longer unequivocally enjoy, or in some cases even tolerate. Yeah, good for you. In particular, I feel very differently about certain Jewish friends, colleagues, and acquaintances. I'm thinking of people who actively affirm their Jewish identity as an important part of their lives, especially those who see Zionism or some special connection to Israel as an important component in their sense of Jewishness. Uh-huh. As I said above... Well, and you're going to... You're going to hate me for bringing this up, but you've definitely had to deal with stuff similar to this. You know, yeah. so. Friends, as I said family, above, as I said above, yes, let me finish. As I said above parents, in the past, in the past, I could look past this difference in our views, but now after Gaza, I can't any longer. I find that all of my interactions with these folks are emotionally colored in a way that prevents me from experiencing the kind of warm fellow feeling I used to feel in their company. I include here not only people defending Israel straightforwardly, actually, I don't pretty much associate with people who do that, but primarily those who, with much liberal hand-wringing and consternation, express their sorrow over the loss of Palestinian life, but then pivot to discussing the horrors of October 7th and the difficulty of dealing with terrorism and Israeli Jewish feelings of insecurity. And then what really gets me going, the worrisome increase in anti-Semitism. I've recently spoken and written uh, about the groundless charge that the protest movement is infected with anti-Semitism, charges that are taken for granted in many spaces, the political and media establishment for starters, but also most prominent Jewish organizations, Jewish Voice for Peace, and if not now, being the notable exceptions. And the Torah, Jew, Torah Jews, too, the Torah rabbis, they're amazing. My writing and speaking about this has been mostly defensive in the sense that I rebut the arguments that claim to show how anti-Semitic the movement is, especially those that conflate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. And while I think publicly rebutting these arguments is necessary, and I'm sure, unfortunately, there will still be a need to do this often in the future, the politically expedient and perhaps necessary adoption of this defensive mode has left me feeling frustrated and inadequate. Here, then, is what I say to these Jewish friends and acquaintances who fret about anti-Semitism, especially those who perceive attacks on Israel as attacks on their identity. One way of thinking about Jewish identity is to think of one's relation to the rest of the Jewish people as a kind of family relation. A people is sort of like a very, very large family. Israel, the Jewish state, can then be, brought, uh, can be thought of as the family project. I think this is how many Jews do feel about Israel and helps to explain their taking criticism of Israel personally. However, while solidarity with and concern for one's family members is certainly a crucial part of identifying with the family, so is taking responsibility for what one's family members do. If my children, say, were to engage in morally atrocious behavior, my greatest concern wouldn't be how people reacted to me and my family. My primary concern would be to rectify the wrong done to the extent possible. So in that vein, I asked... Is the very is the moment the Jewish family project is engaging in genocide the morally appropriate time to worry about negative feelings expressed about Jews? Wouldn't a mensch devote all of their energy to putting a stop to the family's criminal behavior first? 
allying with everyone fighting for mm-hmm. that goal, as we see JVP, and if not now, doing, and put aside one's concerns about how some chants are phrased and some tropes are expressed. See this for a particularly good example of what I'm talking about. And what he's talking about is the phrase from the Revit of the Sea, Palestine will be free, which has been fucking outlawed in states. Mm-hmm. And people are going, they're losing their fucking minds. Not as, it's not as bad as outlawing red triangles. That Minnesota you just know. did. Thanks, or no, Germany. Germany. Germany just did that, right. Yeah. In the spirit of the Salida yeah. tweet, I will then end with this. Anyone who is fretting about anti-Semitism, about the fears and insecurities of Jewish students on campuses, and all the other complaints about anti-Semitic tropes that are sometimes carelessly expressed by those reacting to the horror of Gaza, to them I say, fuck Israel, and let's cut to the chase. If this is what's occupying your concerns right now, in the midst of a genocide being perpetrated by your own people... You're an awful human being. End scene. I disagree with who his choice is and his rationalization for jo- for voting for Joe Biden, but the rest of it I identify with very, very closely. And man. Talk about a douche and a turd. The choice between a giant douche and a steaming turd. All right. We certainly get demonetized for stories like that. So if you appreciate talking about Jews fighting against their own and fighting against the Zionists, the Jewish Zionists that are shaming and browbeating the, the anti-Zionist Jews, as well as intimidating the rest of the world, threatening to dox, trying to get them fired, everything else. Support INN. Support independent media. We're the only people that are holding Israel accountable, that are holding the Zionists accountable, because Zionists are also Christians. As Reef and Cullen did an extensive coverage of about 10 weeks ago on INN News, Christian Zionists in the United States outnumber Jewish Zionists worldwide. Mm -hmm. People don't realize just how strong and how well-funded the Christian Zionist movement is. A lot of that Christian Zionist movement doesn't even realize that they are Christian Zionists. They have no idea. Like, it's just, it's been snuck in and become part of them. It's fucking weird. 